الرحیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم السلام علیکم جی آیا نو پخیر آگلے نی ہاو چونو شم میں وچ ملے و ہائی اگر زائمز گوٹ موگن اولا بونجو پریویت کیفا حال حالی شما چطورے اہلا و سال مرحبا بونا موچو گراسی اسپا بھی اب بلی کرے آیا پوچھ کے آئے دن انایا سائے خویہ مورا چی بتو چی حال جوت کالی میرا خیر و تان and a very warm welcome to everybody who's tuned into PTV World and watching World this morning alongside my very well learned colleague who happens to be Ms. Hajar Sati I happen to be Shazad Asan Khan and we hope and pray that everybody out there is doing wonderfully well and that you're ready to kickstart your day with us but first things first Hello Hajra, Assalamu Alaikum, how are you feeling today and I think that we are finally entering into winters now. Right, uh, Walaikum Assalam, thank you so much Jazakallah Khair for introducing me. I think weather has, temperature has certainly gone down but um, I think it's too soon to speak <laughs> away because of one or two sun, uh, I mean blazing Saturday, sun yeah. and it can really turn around the temperature but um, we are very much enjoying the temperatures in Islamabad and Rawalpindi in the Twin Cities because its uh, temperature has gone down, it's very rainy and in South Asia we do have this tradition of enjoying rains a lot, we eulogize rains a lot. Um, as opposite or contrary to the western traditions because there they enjoy sun a lot because yep. they don't get to see sun that much and obviously it's a colder region as compared to uh, Pakistan because it's located in the southern part of the country but Shazad I was going through very interesting news and there's a good news for those people who have epilepsy or who have fits so there was a, a particular um, experiment that was carried out in the Harvard University and they were very successful in tackling yep, yep, yep. Um, the people who have epilepsy and they're tackling that particular disease because uh, obviously more experts can uh, shed some light on how they are doing it but they were able to disrupt those signals uh, which epilepsy sends towards the brain and this is how um, that was a very successful sort of an experiment and they were able to curb that disease. So in the days to come people who have epilepsy or who have these seizures or fits um, they are going to have a very healthy and they and shared this life. very amazing video of this gentleman making a cup of tea for himself so you know before the vaccine or whatever the treatment was you know it was really hard for him. And then later on, you know, after whatever treatment that, you know, the gentleman underwent, you know, it, he made sure that, you know, that there's not going to be no spilling as well. And I think it's wonderful because my khala, unfortunately, mm -hmm. actually, uh, you know, suffers from such an illness as well, where there's that, a yes. lot of tremors in her hands as mm -hmm. well. So there are special mugs and whatnot. Mm -hmm. But it's going to, you know, I think that you make life easier for a lot of individuals out there. Right. We'll talk about that, you know, because okay. imagine that for everybody who's out there in today's time, everybody wants to be young. You know, even if you're 80 years old, you still want to go out for cycling you want to be trekking you want to be with your grandchildren probably paragliding somewhere as well, well I, I or think parasailing I, I think I do have a disagreement here I don't really want to be young but I want to be really wise out there we will discuss this topic obviously yeah. and we're going to unfold about it but speaking of the festival so Pakistan's we'll largest that, okay. IT and telecom festival ITC and Asia just, yeah. is begins in Karachi uh, showcasing over 750 local and international companies along with the foreign delegates from Saudi Arabia United Arab Emirates and 15 other countries. The three-day event organized by the e-commerce gateway Pakistan Limited in collaboration with the IT ministry is the 25th edition of this annual gathering which aims to unite Pakistan tech and startup community. The festival Hajra is actually featuring uh, you know investors and entrepreneurs from across the IT industry. The event which runs from August 27 to 29 is expected to generate investments exceeding 500 million dollars. Wow! As the first day concluded ITC and Asia had already attracted significant attention with projections of over 70,000 visitors including 350 foreign delegates from 17 countries such as Saudi Arabia, China, Singapore, Azerbaijan, Bahrain, Iran, Egypt and the UAE. Wow, you know, it's a, such a good news for everybody who's out there. And I think it's a season of the festival because the Defense Expo is also going to, uh, I think it's starting from today um, in Pakistan. So all of these exhibitions, these expos signals and point towards an economic captivity in the Pakistan. It's a good news. Um, but now we will uh, again Whether continue. you want to be wise or young. I think I would go with a, a wise person, but with no, uh, what do you call, ailment or disease, right? <laughs> yeah, and I it. want to die a younger person because I don't want to be a burden on the people around me. Matlab, koi dekhne wala ho, na ho, khayal karne wala ho, na ho. Exactly. Yeah. And I just don't believe that death is the end of the life. It's just in another path, you know, a transition from this world to another world, a higher real, wow. right? That's the contentment so, that everybody yes. needs because it's the fear <laughs> that gets us as well, you know. And, you know, if you're an individual like Haja, Alhamdulillah, you know, I've seen that, you know, how she's, uh, you know, very 
very dedicated towards her religion as well. She will do her own research. And that will certainly give you the, type, the kind of contentment that I and our entire team see in Ajra, alhamdulillah. But, you know, when we say young, that means that at 80, you do not have arthritis. That at 80, you do not have such illness where, you know, it's trouble for you to walk. You oh, know, yeah. just being dependent on somebody on else. Neurodegenerative well. diseases. Yes, yes, neurodegenerative Apart diseases. You know, we've heard about PRPs, hair loss, mm -hmm. and how it can help. You know, I was uh, in conversation with this amazing cricketer of Pakistan, Mr. Imran Nazir, okay. where he went through, you know, a long-lasting illness, unfortunately. Unfortunately, and he went through PRPs and multiple injections over uh, a course of period and now alhamdulillah he's doing well and he said that his doctor actually really did help him and it was just because right. of the rich plasma therapies that he was getting and that's exactly something that we would want to talk about is it possible you know so are we trying to defy the uh, you know the laws of nature or the nature actually wants us to kind of make sure that we unveil such technologies and you know we kind of bring it in front of the world where people can actually live a very healthy life you know even if right. they're at the age of 100 right? right and why not kick start this conversation and bring the experts who can guide us uh, on this particular topic so without any further ado we are very glad that we have been joined by dr marwa zafrullah she happens to be a neuroscientist she has an amazing cv to her name and she has accomplished a lot of accolades assalamu alaikum dr marwa and thank you so much for coming to our show alaikum assalam thank you wonderful so much, to Marwa. join you Absolute and alongside pleasure. dr marwa zafrullah ladies and gentlemen we're very lucky that we've been joined by somebody who happens to be the professor of cell and molecular biology and he is dr aftab ahmed Hello, sir. Assalamu alaikum. Good morning. How are you? Waalaikum salam. Uh, I'm very well and thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you so much for joining us. Dr. Maiva, we've seen that there are lots of neurodegenerative diseases, especially as the age progresses, right? We see Parkinson, Alzheimer's, all of these things going on. Number one, what is the correlation with the stress? Do you believe that now when we are living in this modern technology, in the modern age, in the 21st century, there's so many triggers around us, right? Uh, so we have to cater towards our economic well-being, financial well-being. We are looking for and there's so much competition we, generally we are living in a very capitalist economies so do you believe that stress is contributing towards these uh, neurodegenerative diseases and secondly what sort of cure or the research trends there are which you would like to guide mm. us so first I would say that's a really good question and I Thank think you. it's a very much relevant because I did my whole PhD in the area of neurodegeneration wow. so that was like a kind of a very special um, and it's very close to my heart as well sure, sure. Um, so I think you you very beautifully said that you know we are advancing in a lot of technology and innovation but at the same time we are also increasing the competition right and right. we are moving towards a world where the stress where the all the anxiety is being prevalent so of the viewers who are listening to me, the neurodegenerative disorders are basically those kind of diseases right. in which your brain nerves are start dying with the time. So that's right. why right. mostly you saw those kind of disorders start coming in the old population. Because once you're progressing in the age, your brain neurons are start getting weakened up, you know. And in and that weakening process, stress plays a very big role. It's the same okay. way as you think that you can put the stone you know, in, on anything, and you still just keep putting the stones one after another. Mm -hmm. And that's why with the age, you're telling your brain, I'm stressed. Oh. Every time you tell your brain, I'm stressed, I'm anxious, you're putting a stone. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you can imagine that, you know, once you progress toward 40 and 50 years, your brain is like, dude, I'm done. Right. I, I cannot take pressure. I'm, yeah. I'm done. You know, so right. that's exactly the, these all stress are building up. And I think we've seen this trend, particularly within the younger people. I think Shazad will also agree. So we've seen, I think, few uh, moments back or, or I think few months back, Kate Middleton was designated, uh, sorry, uh, diagnosed, diagnosed with the cancer, yeah. right? Um, and there were a couple of Hollywood celebrities. They were also, di and they were very young in their age, right? They were not, you know, above 60s or something like that. You know, in their 30s, in the 40s, they're getting diagnosed with the cancer. Why do you think younger people, um, are getting diagnosed with the cancer and that too in a such an age where we do feel that generally our body's machinery as I would like to say because I'm a lay person um, is generally in a good shape and not in a bad health right so why is there a rising trend uh, of the cancer among the younger people I would say the cancer by itself is a very complicated disorder sometimes okay. it's a, it's, the awareness is going a lot around so people thought that it might be a easy or it's like a one-shot disease it is not like that. Mm -hmm. right. The cancer is not a basically a genetic disorder. The cancer is the one that when your body cells are start behaving abnormally, they start building up this a pattern of division and that pattern of division comes this big mass which we call the tumor, right? right? And we designate that, that this is, might be the cancer. Mm -hmm. There are multiple reasons who can contribute to that. The one of the reason is also, you know, the genetics. Might be you're getting something from your generation and that something is not being prevalent, but at one point it starts showing its effect. Exactly. And in right. addition to this, obviously, you know, because right. unfortunately for all of those people who've been diagnosed with cancers and such illnesses as well, 
you know, our grandparents never went to the doctors as well. <laughs> you know, such advanced testing wasn't even available. Right. So we are not even sure whether, you know, uh, you know, whether our forefathers unfortunately went through such illnesses or not. But very quickly, I would want to move on to Dr. Aftab over here as well, because it's, it's like having healthier cells. That's what we want to talk about. And that's how you, you're going to attain a healthier self-being as well. So imagine that if you are to study today, you know, for example, cancers and all of these things, do you mm -hmm. think that the dietary habits that we have will mm -hmm. actually have an impact on the, on the health of the cells that we have within our own body and it will help us or probably unfortunately not help us to be where our health needs to be? Uh, you're uh, very right, like uh, diet is very, very important and healthy diet is also very important for the body. So we should focus on the healthy diet. Like uh, if we talk about just like Dr. Marwashi was talking about the cancer. So cancer is basically the abnormal growth of cells in the body. And that happens all the time in our, it, there may be many cells which could be cancerous in our body. But what body do, it actually kill those cells. And yeah. sometimes it happens that they keep dividing and that result in the tumor. Diet is very important in the sense like in, in the modern age, like today's age, we are consuming a lot of sugar and sugar is really bad for our body. Oh, yes. yeah. And it, it adds so many diseases, like if we talk about the cardiovascular disease, if we talk about the uh, obesity and many other complications mm -hmm. that results from the overconsumption of sugar. And one of the things that I would love to share is that the cancer cells, they also love sugar. They consume a lot more sugar in our body. That's why if mm. you add more sugar, then they love to grow more. Right. So okay. if you have to like uh, prevent those cancers, then you have to abstain from consuming more and, and sugar. Dr. Aftab, since you are uh, pursuing your uh, degree in the postdoctorate, so would you <coughs> mind sharing what were the, your research area, area of expertise, and what are the results, and what are the new conversation that is happening within your new field? Actually, uh, I started my uh, university uh, in the area of microbiology and molecular genetics. That right. was the start. So microbiology is study of the microorganisms. Mm -hmm. And molecular genetics is you study the hereditary material that is transforming from the upper generation to our generation and so on. Yeah. So that was the start. And my earlier research was on recombinant DNA technology. I was working with the recombinant proteins. And for example, we are taking the insulin. So insulin we produce through the recombinant DNA technology. Yeah. And then I moved uh, uh, towards the MS that was also uh, related to the microbiology that was in biotechnology. Mm -hmm. Then my PhD was in cell biology mm -hmm. wow. and my postdoc was in tissue engineering. So it was quite a shift from microbiology to regenerative medicine to tissue engineering. Right. So I have a couple of <laughs> questions now. First of all, you know, because you mentioned about insulin as well, a lot of people I don't know, you know, this is something b what I said to all of my family members as well when they came up with this idea of injecting Ozampic, you know, so let's, let's talk about it. First of all, it's an injection which everybody's using for weight loss and it plays with the body insulin levels as well. You know, let's talk about this first and then we'll move on towards weaker tissues and weaker bones, please. Mm -hmm. So, you know, uh, actually what happens in our body, if we consume uh, more sugar, then uh, actually what happens, there is a more uh, production of insulin and insulin actually result in number of complications in body. For example, one of the very common thing is the diabetes. So what happens in diabetes actually, uh, that is called the insulin insensitivity in the body. So you produce the insulin, but that, not is, that is not taken up by the cells. So it, like, uh, it, it, it is in our body and that result in many other complications. So one of the therapy that is being used all over the world is to uh, actually lower the concentration of insulin our, in okay. our body because it actually get up, uh, like if we consume more uh, sugar, then it build up and then we have to reduce its, uh, its concentration. So that's, that's one of the problems. That's actually at the molecular level what happens inside our body. So what we, uh, for the weight loss, I think we should move to more towards, not right. for the injections, okay. like injections is the, like the right. ultimate solution yeah. which we can uh, like try, but uh, the other option, there are so many other options we can, like inter intermittent fasting is a very famous term nowadays. Yep. Right. Intermittent fasting is the best therapy for so many diseases as well as for the weight exactly. loss. And, and, and with growing age, what we have seen <laughs> is that, uh, you know, because we discussed about cancers as well and the mm -hmm. causes of the cancers, what happens is that people, you know, who live with such conditions, you know, they will see in later years that their muscle tissue is going to get weaker. You know, unfortunately, there will be illnesses such as, you know, probably disc prolapses and whatnot, mm -hmm. and then muscle dystrophy. I'll come back to you because it's your subject <laughs> as well. But what about weaker tissue, muscle tissues in your body, and how do you think <coughs> that we can get them back in uh, shape and health? 
It's a very important question and I love this question because this is I'm studying so, for the last 50 years. <laughs> <laughs> so actually what happens in our body, mm -hmm. God has gifted us with a very unique kind of cells. Those are called the stem cells. Okay. So stem cells are in our body which are at higher concentration at the earlier age and that goes less and less when we are growing old. Yep. So why there are wrinkles on our skin? What happens actually initially when we are young? Uh, our cells, they are dying constantly. Okay. For example, our skin cells, they die after four weeks. So after four weeks, you have totally new cells. Yeah. So there, are, there is a source of stem cells at the back. So when the cells die off, new cells are totally, in, uh, yeah. they come up and replace the old ones. So what happens when we are getting old and wrinkles on our face? That's, that's the, like one of the things that we notice the more. So what happens, uh, we have less uh, replication of those stem cells. So there is a more dying cells and less producing. That's why oh. it's happened to the, our skin, it okay. happens to our muscles, it happens to our bones, everywhere. So the stem cells actually concentration goes down in our body and the replication is actually decreased. That's why we get and all those symptoms. Uh, Dr. Aftab, when we are speaking <coughs> about these changes in the cells, and since you're in the expert in the field and you will um, enlighten us about all of this things, so there are lots yeah. of questions regarding the ethics, right? Uh, so uh, when we, like Shazad mentioned, you know, there was a, a phrase that he used that are we uh, playing with the nature? Are we changing the nature? when we are talking about uh, changing the genes or whatever the DNA of things right so sometimes it is done to um, I mean a condensed rate of uh, or, or, or to diffuse or to make sure that they, there's a stoppage of the diseases transferring from generation to generation but then again when we are talking about the research technology there was this particular study that I came across that people want to change their eye colors based on mm -hmm. those you know changes in those genes right um, they want to enhance the aesthetics so again uh, we are playing with the nature right and as Quran mentioned that you are uh, going to play with my creation uh, right no no it, it talks about that how of course there's a verse about there but it talks about that how um, we have created you on the best of the image right so we are based on the fitra of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so again where this conversation on the ethics lead us to and are there conversations here start emerging in, in the in this particular field that you are um, expert in, in Pakistan so actually yes there is always discussion so mm -hmm. when I started my university these were the same eugenics we used to talk at that time. So these are the questions since uh, there was a start of technology. So what happens are uh, being researchers, our main target is to cure the disease. For example, if we talk about the genetic diseases, uh, the initial disease that was cured uh, long ago in 1990s was skid. Mm. Uh, that was one of the uh, immunological condition that was through one of the genes so you can cure uh, those genes. So what happens actually in our body, everything in our body is controlled by the genes. So we have a certain set of genes. Initially we used to think they are a lot more in number. They are 300,000 genes. Then we learned that they are 100,000. Now we learned that they are around 25,000 genes. Yeah. So whatever feature we have, like hair color, eye color, uh, our muscle strength, our brain function, our IQ. Yeah. So everything is controlled on one side is controlled by the genes. On the so on one side you can control the diseases, mm -hmm. uh, you can slow the aging process, but on the other side you can have those features. So if you want like blue eyes, there is a gene which control the blue. If right. you want to have like more fair complexion, so you, right. there is also, like, it's a complex yeah, trait, but there's expression of genes. So if you control those. Yeah. <laughs> and I truly believe, you know, why not? You know, if you can do that, I think, you know, you know now that people know that, okay, yeah, you know, we, we can probably do that or we can probably make people uh, make sure that they're not going to fall sick too much. You know, I think that, you know, these are the things that we should be doing. Now, moving on back to Dr. Marva over here as well. Now, because you're a neuroscientist yourself and there must be too much to it as well, but, you know, speaking about the issues that we have gone through is that we have seen the people who have had neurological disorders, unfortunately. Yes. We touched upon it, you know, unfortunately in the el older ages yes. or probably by birth. Do you think that in days to come, we will come up with ways where we can detect, for example, there's a dandy walker is an illness, unfortunately, where the kids do not have the smaller brain connected with their spinal cord as well, where they cannot sit and stand and whatnot. Unfortunately, till today, you know, there's no ultrasound technique with which we can actually be 100% sure. So do you think that neuroscience is actually working on such techniques where we are able to make sure that the baby is going to be healthier or that we will have treatments or interventions before even they are born? Yes, we are working on that. Things are in progress. In neuroscience, the, in past decades, the neuroscience has progressed a lot. Right. There is a lot of things that being comes up that people, you know, some of the innovation is being out there, but there's a lot of work that is being happening on the end at this moment. Right. I would say in the imaging that you're specifically mentioning, um, the imaging field is progressing very much. Technology is coming up. Um, there is a lot of new ways by which we are looking forward much and much deeper level at that point. 
And also now the genetics is being playing such a big role. We know that all of these disorders, especially the neuromuscular one that you guys were touching upon, are very much linked with the genetics of the individual. Right. So we are being working on that end. Uh, my special area is a biomarker identification, which is what means is that I am basically looking for the changes that is happening on a molecular level in such a small scale, which you might not able to see a decade ago, right? Yeah. Um, and what we are trying to do is that we want to detect those changes before the symptoms come, right. before the disease become like, you know, is being evident. So then we can diagnose that one ahead of time and help those, as you yeah. said, you yeah. know, way more faster than <coughs> where we are standing Which is today. why I'm going to bring this, uh, you know, it's, a, it's, it's more of a story now. You know, this, my doctor shared it with me and they said that, you know, they were able to figure out a gene which is responsible for you to from birth to which will take you to your younger age and then it will trigger another gene which will take you to you know being old and they said that we figured out a way where we can control that that gene is the you know the younger gene is not going to actually uh, go and kick start the older age gene as well do you think that things like these in future will be really common and that people at 100 will look like 32 years old or 33 years old you know dying younger basically do you think that that will be possible in the near future i think um, i said why not because aging is, we all, no one want to die. If you ask anyone, they're like, yes. no, I don't want to die, right? And everyone wants to go to heaven, right? <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. Without exactly. dying, yeah. No dying is like, you know. <laughs> so everyone wants to live longer. Everyone wants to live younger. It yeah. is always being, I think it's a basic human instinct, mm. you know, to have a healthy life, to have a beautiful, <laughs> you know, <laughs> personality. <laughs> So, um, you're right. I think it's, and this is, this field, and one of the other things I want to say is that there's a big industry of cosmetics. If oh you yeah, look over there, the big objective of that industry is mm -hmm. to make you feel more and more beautiful every day. So, True. their big intention is that to make you more confident about yourself, right? So, they are being, having a, such a big interest is that how we, we can keep the people beautiful and younger for such a long amount but, of but time. But Dr. Mava, when we are talking about this very budding um, multi-billion dollar, um, dollar industry, which is the cosmetic industry, so again, then I would link this conversation to the triggers or the stresses like um, anxiety and the depression because obviously there's so much competition, right? You have to look very Caucasian in order to be acceptable, in order to look beautiful. Um, and do you think in, in the days to come, we will see those conversations um, within this particular field of your uh, area of expertise? where we are going to tackle this disease or this uh, competition, I would say excessive competition that is going on. Uh, because again, um, in, in search of, you know, looking better and, you know, uh, showing people off that we are living a better, I think we are attaining a lot of other diseases, right? So that yeah. might be a trigger for that. So do you think that we will move in this direction? We will say that, you know, whoever you are, you are beautiful as you are. Yeah. I I Good would question. say this is a very beautifully said, True. you know, and this is a very much need of time. Um, mm. And that's why when we talk with the people, we tell them it's like, you know, diversity is a beauty of the world. If everyone looks True. alike and if everyone is being like talking in the same way, mm. everybody being like, you know, dressing the same way, mm. you will get bored. This is a human person. You're <laughs> like, you oh so my God. Saying that. Yeah. Right? Yes. It's like, <laughs> I don't, I don't want to look around. I'm done. This is like, I'm just seeing the same picture every day. Yeah. So this diversity, these colors, you know, all of these beautiful features that right. we have, the aging with the time, mm. this is all is being glorifying who you are as being a human. This mm. is a part of being a human, right? right so right. I think we, we definitely have these talks that needs to be done, especially with the youth. Exactly. Yeah. Right. And thank you so much for saying that. You know, we shorten time and our producers is actually on it that, you know, <laughs> but it's a very fruitful <laughs> conversation for anybody who's hearing it. And, you know, so I actually want to second what you said and Haja said. Now, imagine that for wherever I've been traveling, I've seen a lot of similar faces now, you know, with Botox and fillers, <laughs> everybody <laughs> almost looks the same. And I'm like, you know what, that's not what, what we would want to see. You know, we want people to see differently, right? You know, not everybody should look the same. Everybody's got bigger lips, you know, probably Botox on their foreheads as well, you know, you're, whatever it is, you know. But ladies and gentlemen, we really need to come back to being natural. Now, sir, very quickly towards the end, one last question, and that is that in these times that we, have, uh, we are experiencing, we have seen that a lot of degenerative diseases or illnesses, for example, arthritis and other issues mm. related with bones, what happens is that people do say that, you know, no, no, there are injections available, gel injections and PRP yes. injections and whatnot. Do you really think that these therapies work? Because you happen to have a lot of research, you know, at the back of your experiences as mm -hmm. well. You know, so I would <coughs> want you to kind of, you know, look into the camera, just talk mm -hmm. to the people, 46 okay. different countries, <laughs> and tell them, you know, if, if it's possible for us to, you know, rather than <coughs> PRP karao or achi zindgi guzaro, yeah, you know, yeah. something like that. 
So actually the thing is, uh, this is the new area of research which is called the regenerative medicine which is very much coming up. So the future of medicine is called the regenerative medicine. Okay. So regenerative medicine has a lot of components. So one of the initial components, you know initially we used to go uh, to the doctor and he, he prescribed some medicines, we consume those medicines and we get fine <coughs> to some extent yeah. and they also have a lot of side effects. Uh, then we are actually, uh, for the last 20 years, we are very much into the regenerative medicines. There are so many components of regenerative medic medicine. For example, you have talked about the PRP, which is very much coming up. Then there is a PRF, that is another technology. And then uh, there's exosome Plater therapy. Rich fibrin. Then stem cell therapy is yeah. also a, like becoming very popular all over the world. So for example, you have uh, osteoarthritis. So in this case, uh, actually the cartilage is damaged. Yeah. So initially, uh, like if you are at stage one, you can go for the PRP or hyaluronic acid therapy. So you can inject and then you can uh, regenerate the cartilage. If you are at stage two or stage three, then you can go for the stem cell therapy. Okay. So what we can do, we take the cell from the belly, so you have excessive fat. We can extract the uh, cells from the fat. There are a lot of stem cells there. And we can put into the uh, knee, and so and we can regenerate right. yeah. those thank, damage. Thank you so much, Dr. Aftab, for having this wonderful conversation. Thank you so much, Dr. Mawa, for having this wonderful, insightful discussion about the modern trends in this particular field and about enlightening us that how we need to live more healthier lifestyle. So with that, we're going on a short break. And after we come back, we have an interesting debate lined up. Don't go anywhere. Good morning. Good morning. and before going on to the break we were having a discussion regarding the health of our bodies right so now we are going to talk about uh, regarding the health and the state of the health of our planet earth and obviously when we talk about the um, health of our planet earth we cannot discount the discussions around the climate change because climate change is a factor it's a phenomena that has gripped the entire world and humanity into it and how important it is to have this discussion and that too at a global level because this is a fight of the humanity and if we want to save the planet earth if we want to lead a healthy lifestyle if you want to um, incorporate that lifestyles and give them and present them to a younger generation of course these are the conversations that we need to have it and I think that what is important in the, because it's a very vast area there's a, a the element of the factor of the women empowerment at the intersection of the youth mobilization young movement and there are a lot of younger people who are actually talking about the climate change so what sort of mobilization is required to make sure that the people who are at the top of the affairs who are at the um, power corridors how how do we mobilize them and make sure that they're also aligning their policies with the climate change? So uh, without any further ado, we would like to indulge into this discussion and unpack that how um, younger people can be better mobilized in order to walk the talk on this discussion in the area called climate change. We are very glad that we have been joined by a very wonderful and a bright student called Zainab Wahid. She has been very um, adv advocating this issue of the climate change and speaking very ferociously and very passionately over that. Assalamu alaikum Zainab. And thank you so much for coming well, to our show. Thank you so much for it's having me. It's wonderful to have you over here. First of all, you know, the our audiences need to know what you've accomplished so far. You know, so obviously only Pakistani student to receive a full right scholarship to Carlton College. Pakistan's representative to UNICEF's Youth Foresight Fellowship 2023-2024. Recipient of the Climate Hero Award by the United Nations of Pakistan and the Ministry of Climate Change. And the list goes on. So for everybody who's out there, ladies and gentlemen, now when she's going to speak, obviously it'll make sense. Please go ahead. Thank you so much for having me. And we were talking about climate change um, and youth mobilization. And right? youth mobilization. I think it is really important because we as a generation will be the first generation that um, will experience the true potential 
destruction of climate change and the last generation that can actually do something about it because time is running out. Mm -hmm. um, and so in my activism, I reach out to madrasas in my vicinity and I try to talk to them about climate change um, and I teach girls specifically about what climate change is, not in super specific scientific jargon, but with very simple words and try to explain um, what the challenges that we might face are. And the point is to not only just make them aware, but also to help them and by extension their community communities to prepare for disaster that will strike them the most. And but what sort of conversations did you develop? Because that's a very interesting point of discussion that how she wants to have a change and start the conversation at the community level from mm. the basic level. And that's yeah. very important because, um, yes, of course, states are responsible for how people or the citizens uh, behave in a way. But I think the grooming and the uh, nurturing also starts in the basic level at the family basic unit level. And I think Madrasa is um, an area as a point of uh, community learning center where a lot of students were unable or yeah. cannot afford these studies go there because yeah. you know it's cheaper they are providing you food and they're also providing you with a religious education with yeah. the theological debates right so what sort of um, conversations did you have with them and and do you think the audience was receptive of what mm -hmm. you were saying because if someone is coming from the outside and yeah. saying like that there are lots of connotations mm -hmm. attached to it right it that the ladies of the western world are coming yeah. or you know western 100%. thoughts are coming there mm -hmm. so how, how how receptive were the there audience definitely skeptical about it at first but when you sit down and try, try to talk to them in Urdu in their regional languages uh, and I also do it in Abbottabad which is where my family is from we try to do it in uh, regional uh, languages and the point is to sort of strike at the root cause of a lot of the skepticism that is here whenever flood strike we see people saying um, terming it as punishment from God for all of the sins that we as humanity commit. So we're trying to um, address that, but at the same time also trying to build a community that is ready to take climate action and also demand climate action, not only from our governments, but also internationally. Exactly, but you know, alongside this, we do know for a yeah. fact that, you know, Pakistan obviously is the most vulnerable yes. towards climate change as well. And it's not because of what Pakistan has mm -hmm. done, but it's mm -hmm. probably other countries who have contributed to it. So how do you think when we talk about climate change mm -hmm. uh, or climate action, how do you think that you know such awarenesses at such grassroots yeah. level will eventually help and build up and make sure that we demand justice from the communities or probably the countries who are actually responsible yeah. for making us vulnerable to climate change? Yeah. So this concept of climate injustice, who is responsible, who is not, and who is being most impacted, is what I try to explain is um, that we are, while we are not responsible for causing climate change and while we as individuals can... Uh, maybe swap out a cloth bag for a plastic bag. That's not going to stop climate change as it is at the pace that it is going on right now. True. What we can do is prepare ourselves for, for climate disasters that we know are predicted, that we know will strike every year. So my focus is on adaptation instead of mitigation, which is stopping climate change at its root cause, which is stopping fossil fuels industries. Yep. So Madrasa girls, if they get together, they cannot take down these huge fossil fuels industries. Yeah. And I would want to add on over here as well, because now imagine that, you know, mm -hmm. we do host a lot of shows, me and Hajra, you right. know, we go all over the world and Humbler doing that. So I was in Karachi, Hajra, you know, I right. think it was on the 9th of this month where we were in Mohata Palace for the Rice Export Association of Pakistan and TW, the Trade Development Association of Pakistan. Right. Imagine that they brought to life an event where, you know, it was a green event. Now imagine okay. that they had, so I'm going, a big shout out to Pani, you know, because imagine what Pani is doing is that they actually sort out a method with, with which that, you know, the sugar cane leftovers, they're making water bottles, which oh, you wow. can refill for a hundred yeah. times and, you know, then you can use mm -hmm. it, right? And it's obviously 100%, uh, uh, it will turn into composite as well. Now imagine the second bit was that wherever we sent invitations, with whatever paper we use, you know, if you're going to make sure that you're going to sow it, mm -hmm. there will be a plant which is going yeah. to come out. You know, so the people are coming up with smart ways as well. And we're going to think about it. And then there were people who would pick up whatever garbage was left behind, recycle it and then donate it wherever it and was required. So, you know, such right. initiatives will always help us to move on towards and that path. Adding to this conversation, and uh, I think you've also had the, uh, had the honor of going to the Hunza and all these northern areas, and you will witness there that what they have done is, especially in Skadu, I've seen that um, in, in, term, in place of the plastic uh, dustbins, they have placed those jute uh, made yeah, yeah, uh, dustbins yeah, yeah, yeah. there, right? And they look very statically pleasing. And my mother used to tell that, you know, before the advent of the plastic, this is what we uh, used to adorn a lot of places there, right? So I think modern human has realized that this 
corporate greed of industrialization and of this greed of you know churning yeah. out a lot of uh, plastic products in order to gain a lot of money uh, but uh, the ancient human has a lot of ancient wisdom in that and you know we need to revert back to those days yeah. right so uh, when you were talking to those girls in the madrasas yeah. right and obviously there is this religious narrative that whatever we are doing you know um, allah punishes us right so and i think this is um, in, in a modern secular terminology you can say that though this is how we have disturbed the nature mm -hmm. and now nature is coming back to strike yeah. us in the form of the climate yeah. change so how do you reconcile these two narratives right the secular narrative versus the spiritual or the mm -hmm. theological narrative so that they are more effective number one and secondly um, that helps in curbing the carbon footprint which is very much important in this conversation yeah i think that's important um, what i do is try to explore what the past has been like and what the future could be like uh, with madrasa girls in specific but also with other communities other uh, segments of students as well mm -hmm. it is called foresight this activity and i've learned the act of foresight the study of foresight with unicef over the last year and so to try to reconcile the religious segments and the more secular segments of our society what i think is more effective is instead of trying to explore intersectionality between them we focus on each one of them individually mm -hmm. and i do that by doing foresight workshops with madrasa girls separately and then foresight workshops with students from formal educational sectors separately mm -hmm. and with foresight what we're able to do is we're able to learn from the past we're able to figure out how we want to move into the future what is our ideal preferred future right. we imagine that and then we sort of backtrack into present and we sort of figure out what could we have done today to get to that ideal preferred future oh. 20 years from now 30 years from now right. the point is to give agency back to the people that we're doing these workshops with right. so for example in 2022 a mm -hmm. uh, 20 year old girl sajda mm -hmm. who's almost my age was impacted by floods and she didn't have a lot of food for 15 days i interviewed her for a unicef blog um and then she talked about how her entire family got malaria but she was most worried about the next floods she doesn't know when the next floods will be and whether she will yes. survive in them or not yeah. right. the point is to get across how people impacted in crises do not have the agency to imagine a future at all when mm. the present is so, so forecast, challenging basically yes so the point of foresight is to give agency back to them and create a very democratic playing ground where they're able to also contribute to conversations about the future how are you empowering them by giving <coughs> back to the agency yes you are having this discussion right that yeah. you know, imagining the, the, the you know what sort of mm -hmm. future we are going to have but again yes we are having this conversation with the, there could be gloom and doom if you cannot yeah. um, you know we do not mend our you know present practices but then having a more healthier practices and incorporating that change and when we talk about behavioral change it's a very very difficult mm -hmm. task Definitely because you know yes. you have imbibed those behavior from a childhood passed yeah. from generation to generation and learning those patterns is one hell of a task how yeah. are you going it to do that it definitely is so just um on monday this week i went to work and <coughs> and um i had this workshop with uh, girls from underprivileged mm -hmm. backgrounds in a school and so <clears throat> we were <clears throat> sorry okay, take your time no problem we were able to figure out what their preferred future is and that is a future where there is an equal distribution of wealth true and uh, their primary concerns were extreme poverty 20 years from now in pakistan mm -hmm. and so we figured out our preferred future which was equal distribution of wealth and then for the for a whole hour at the end of the activity i talked to the girls about how they can empower themselves and their communities so very unique ideas in the sense the one said i could start a mehndi business i could put henna designs on people's hands mm -hmm. and that i could start a business like that another said i could learn sewing and not only empower my family mm -hmm. but also the community around me and others said i could make baskets yeah. so this is how through small conversations which are very nuanced if you look into it they're empowering themselves giving themselves agency but also giving their communities it's it's a wonderful idea but i believe that you know that that we really need to change the kind of conversations that we have in because sewing has been around you know and we've mm -hmm. always spoken about how we can empower people and you know there are new set of skills which people really need to kind of learn today yeah. to make sure that you know that we have equal wealth but you know i'm very sorry that i'm segueing from the conversation but you know because you're a bright child and i would want your mm -hmm. perspective on this so the one last question that i'm going to ask you is that don't you think that rather than saying that we want equal distribution of wealth we should say equal distribution of opportunities yeah yeah but i do think opportunities also stem from wealth um because and uh, what we do is an activity called that's your opinion though yeah 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 um 
<clears throat> an activity called images of the future where participants draw what their future is and um, a lot of the images I see are about poverty uh, where uh, children aren't able to go to schools there is capitalism stealing lands from local communities and um, local bazaars and malls are being mm -hmm. set up uh, there is people who uh, students who are forced to then work instead of study so all of these I think w we could trace back the root cause to wealth and the lack and, of and thereof. one last question before we wrap up Zainab so we have seen um, when we talk about the student mobilization or youth mobilization within the arena of climate change so we have seen that there is a very strong sort of a reaction mm -hmm. coming especially from the West right so we've seen that a lot of younger people they're very angry at that yeah. issue and in order to regulate that anger what they're doing is they're going to different galleries you know they're yeah. sabotaging different um, uh, what do you call it the paint uh, paintings which are very very expensive and then they are blocking the road yeah. Do you think such sort of, um, because a lot of people are terming it as climate vandalism, right? Mm -hmm. So such sort of conversation are helping this cause of climate change or is it not creating the sort of desire effect that we are creating? I know these conversations are not being held in Pakistan because we do not witness such sort of vandalism here. But soon you will be moving to a Western society, right? So do you think these conversations help this sort of mobilization help or is it just tainting um, this, with this very collective movement. I think when you look internationally, uh, we do not have the conversations that we need to be having about climate change. Okay. There is, imagine a complete utter silence where people sort of avert these conversations at all. I think in that complete silence, any conversations are good. And to get that sort of conversation started, I think extreme measures need to be taken. So unless they're, for, for example, blocking roads where people need ambulances to get to hospitals, that's obviously morally wrong. But if they're just going to, um, say, throw tomato juice at a painting that's covered in glass, it's at least getting conversation started. And I think it is very symbolic of the resentment that people have. So I do. I know people can disagree with this, yeah. but I do yes. think these conversations need but to be But it's good. Uh, thank you so much, Anna, for being with us. It's good, you know, that, you know, that... Uh, I our think she has the optimism our, yeah. of a younger person, yeah. right? So and we don't have that. Exactly. Our future generations have actually their own opinion. And, you know, we should always yeah. value them as well. And, you know, in later in stages, we will always, or we can change, earn, learn, learn again. Yeah. No, so that's the entire process. But congratulations to you for your full ride scholarship as well. Best of luck. You. Maji, you are here. Aapko bhoat bhoat mubarak <laughs> for everybody who's out there. I think it's children like these, you know, who we truly have faith in that, you know, that they will bring a lot of prosperity and success, you know, for our communities, for our country as well. So ladies and gentlemen, for everybody who's out there, you know, our news anchor is at the news desk as well. So please make sure that you stay tuned. Until next time, look after yourselves. One, two, three. It's good a good morning. morning. Have a good day. Bye.